Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We're in the back. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. We didn't get a chance to try out the microphone tonight, so we just we know we have to make eye contact. And if you look puzzled or so, at some point, if you can't hear us, please wave your arm and don't uh, don't just sit quietly because we want everybody to be able to listen to tonight's program. Uh, I wanted to welcome you to the final program in this summer's 11th annual Tony Wyack Summer History Festival. And before I get started, I, I would like to mention also that the ticket um, takers tonight, David and Jan, um, found a, what might have been an error. Somebody may have left more money with us than they thought they were leaving. And if that was you, it was just it just happened toward the end of the, when the ticket people were coming in. And if that was you and you didn't mean to leave that, talk to Jan and um, we'll straighten that out for you. And if you meant to do it, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this festival is jointly sponsored by two local groups, the Washburn Area Historical Society and the Washburn Heritage Association. You, you can find video recordings of many of our past programs on, on the WHA site or website, um, as well as at, our, at the historic <coughs> museum. These recordings, recordings include three earlier presentations by tonight's speaker. And the season has been funded in part by a grant from Wisconsin Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Humanities strengthens the roots of community life through educational and cultural programs that inspire civic participation and individual imagination. Any views? Findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this project do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. <laughs> okay, thank you to the Harborview Event Center for hosting these programs. Uh, thank you to our committee members who plan these events and volunteer time to make them, them happen. And thank you to our audience for your support. Tonight, we welcome back past presenter, Pete Mam. Pete's first Tony Wojak presentation was in 2016, when he spoke about Washburn's namesake. In 2017 and 2018, Pete came back and he talked to us about the history of the Washburn Public Library. He actually did that in two parts, so we got the early years and we got the later years. Uh, tonight's presentation was postponed several times because of COVID restrictions. Uh, we are thankful for, to Pete for sticking with us through these postponements, and we have been looking forward to having Pete back to tell about Washburn's role in the establishment of the first civilian conservation corps camp in Wisconsin. Take us back eight, 89 years, Pete, what was happening here? Let's welcome Pete Mann. Thank you very much. As David said, this program has been two and a half years in the making. And over that time, I've come across additional materials. And it gets to the point where you've got so much material that you really don't know how to focus on it. And you forget about everything that you've discovered. So I'll try to uh, get through what I've been putting together for the last couple of years. The Civilian Conservation Corps was the first program of the alphabet soup of relief efforts of the Franklin Roosevelt administration. And it was intended to help restore the economic health of this nation during the Great Depression. It began within weeks of Roosevelt's inauguration. And can you imagine our Congress acting that fast? <laughs> it, it, it is rather amazing. The Corps is sometimes referred to as Roosevelt's tree army or as soil soldiers 
but the Corps was much more than that. The Corps assisted in flood relief efforts. They fought forest fires. They constructed and manned fire towers, built roads and fire breaks, eradicated forest diseases, undertook lake surveys, developed state and national parks. In fact, the effort put in by the Corps in developing this nation's state and national parks far exceeded anything that was done before or since. They planted fish, they improved wildlife habitats, they constructed bridges and waterway impoundments, they created many of the national forest campgrounds and recreation areas that we enjoy. Closer to home, the CCC worked with the Works Public Administration in doing the improvements of Copper Falls and Patterson State Parks. Many of the campgrounds in the Shawamigan were the result of the CCC. The Trees for Tomorrow Camp in Eagle River was also constructed by the CCC, as well as many Forest Service ranger stations. And here's a little tidbit you may not know. The CCC assisted with the Wisconsin Settler Relocation Project outside of Drummond. In the 1930s, 32 homes were built southwest of Drummond on 20 acre tracks in an effort to colonize the cutover. Many of those homes are still there if you drive the back roads. But the CCC was not only a rural phenomenon, the CCC gave us the Wisconsin UW-Madison Arboretum and the Whitnell Park Botanical Gardens in Milwaukee. <clears throat> Roughly 16 miles west of Washburn, along a shaded lane off of Forest Road 236, there is a sign and the remnants of foundations of long removed buildings. The sign is perhaps one of up a hundred in the state of Wisconsin, each marking the location of a camp of the most popular program of Roosevelt's New Deal. The sign doesn't at all allude to the significance of Camp Prince, the role of prey played in the New Deal, or surprisingly even identify the first company that resided there. You can't see it on this slide, but you can see the company numbers on the first slide I showed, Company 640 of the Civilian Conservation Corps occupied this camp for two years, and it's not even on the sign. As soon as Roosevelt was inaugurated, he introduced legislation to create what was called the Emergency Conservation Work Act. Just 27 days after he took office, the act was passed. The act established a program that was to become the CCC and addressed the nation's two wasted resources, young men and the land. It enabled FDR to create the agency. The object objectives of the act were to provide jobs for those that were on relief, to conserve human resources and build up enrollees physically and spiritually, and start the nation on a path of creating sound conservation practices. Roosevelt believed in extending aid to the impoverished was a social duty, and he previewed the concept of the CCC during his nomination acceptance speech in the 1932 Democratic National Convention. The CCC was patterned after a similar program that Roosevelt had established a year before as governor of the state of New York. The CCC enjoyed overwhelming public support throughout its history, but it was fraught with politics and received criticism <laughs> from all quarters. Conservatives lamented the cost of the program, even though it only cost $1.92 per day for each enrollee in the organization. Organized labor opposed it because they feared it would take away union paying jobs. The War Department claimed it would detract from national readiness. General Douglas MacArthur was given oversight of, of the military's participation in the program. He was a very good friend of Roosevelt, but he complained bitterly about the task. 
he said it detracted from the nation's military readiness, but in fact the opposite was true. Though the program wasn't a military readiness effort, it provided experience for the Reserve Officer Corps, conditioned participants physically and emotionally for the regimental lifestyle of military camp, and set up a system for national mobilization that would be required of the war just eight years in the future. Some state leaders and environmentalists opposed it, chiefly Aldo Leopold from Wisconsin. He decried the lack of ecological understanding and the projects that were undertaken by the Corps. State Park Director C.L. Harrington also opposed it. He didn't want anything to do with the CCC working in state parks or even in the cutover. He didn't like the concept of CCC boys being lodged at public expense and didn't appeal to the general line of thinking of any of us from this part of the country, he said. Even local residents in communities like Washburn and Bayfield County complained about the establishment of camp ranks for fear that it would deprive them of job opportunities in the newly created national forest. Veterans didn't like the program either because the program didn't provide for them. The program chiefly provided for unmarried males and veterans by a large part were married. The uh, program was amended over time to provide for veterans, but not as a, it was originally proposed. Roosevelt originally wanted 500,000 unemployed people working in the CCC by the summer of 1933. Can you imagine that? The program started, was approved in March, it was implemented in April, and he wanted 500,000 people working by the summer of 1933. He didn't get that, he got 250,000. The act was quite vague on the program structure which was kind of fortunate for Roosevelt because he implemented the program via executive orders. Congress only authorized the program for six months, but it was reauthorized time and time again because it was so popular. The first men enrolled in the program just six days after the act passed. The CCC was managed by four federal departments. The Department of Labor selected enrollees to the local relief agencies. The War Department conditioned enroll enrollees and managed the camps. The Department of Agriculture provided technical support and personnel to work out projects in uh, national forests. And the Interior Department did likewise for projects in state and national parks. Uh, Robert Beckner, a national labor leader, was appointed by Roosevelt as director of the CCC. I believe he was chosen because he was well respected in the country, particularly in labor circles, and it kind of diminished labor's opposition to the program. But ironically, even though Fechner was a labor leader, he opposed unionization of CCC enrollees and he prohibited organizers in the camps. His orders were to discharge any enrollee who joined in the union. Uh, he died in 1939, and unfortunately, his influence and his persuasiveness and advocation of, uh, of the CCC uh, ended with his death, and the program declined after that. Val Hansen, a Washburn native, did not work at Camp Brinks, but he was uh, a technical expert associated with the CCC. He served in Camp Delta, not too far from today's Delta Diner, and he left a journal of his experiences titled With the Three Seas in the North Woods, which David Bradley shared with me, and I thank you for that, David. While many journals and letters and photographs of CCC enrollees have survived over time, not much has been has survived related to Camp Brinks. Consequently, little is known about the actual day-to-day -day life in Camp Brinks, but I'll be commenting now and then on Val's 
uh, comments related to uh, Camp Delta, which give an idea of what life in the CCC was like. To be eligible for the CCC, one had to be a United States citizen, had to be unemployed, and from a family receiving public relief. Single people and transients were not part of the program. You, had, you couldn't be attending school, you had to be a male and single. I, just retracting what I just said a moment ago. When I said transients and single people weren't allowed, you had to be part of a family unit because the idea was for money earned in the CCC being transferred to your family to provide economic relief for that family. You had to be originally between the ages of 18 and 25, that was modified later to 17 to 28. You had to be healthy and capable of physical labor. You couldn't be too short, you couldn't be too tall, and you couldn't be too light, and you had to have at least three serviceable, natural, masticating teeth in your upper and lower jaws. Priority was given to those who would allot a cash allowance to needy relatives. CCC enrollees were paid $30 a month of which $25 had to go back to their families to support them in their communities. Unattached, homeless, and transient men, as I said, were not selected because families would not have benefited. And the program as originally adopted it excluded veterans, women, and Native Americans. Now, as I mentioned, the program was modified later on. Veterans camps were provided where veterans did not live at camp. They lived at home and they worked on CCC projects. Same is true with Native Americans. Native Americans, and this is part of the conflicting message of the research that I've, I've undertaken. One source says Native Americans worked strictly on Indian reservations. Another source says that they did work in other places as well. Hold the mic. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Enrolling in the CCC was strictly voluntary. Prospective enrollees were interviewed in their homes by the local relief agency in the community they lived in. Once they were certified by the Department of Labor, they were sent to the nearest Army recruiting station for acceptance. And if they were accepted by the Army, after a physical examination, they would be sent to a conditioning camp. Almost 9% of those that uh, went through a physical examination failed the exam. And once the Army accepted the enrollee, the work of the Labor Department was completed. If accepted, they were sent to the nearest camp. In our case, it would have been Fort Sheridan, north of Chicago. They took the oath of office, they received vaccinations for smallpox and typhoid. They were clothed, conditioned, and assigned to a company. By conditioned, they essentially went through a physical exercise routine so that they could endure the, the physical labors that would be required at them in camp. And they were equipped for work in the field. After three weeks, they would have been sent out to the field. CCC workers were provided old army uniforms because if you can imagine a country in an economic downturn and all of a sudden you're putting 250,000 people to work, industry was not geared up to manufacture the uniforms and clothing that were needed for this particular mission. So they used old World War II or old World War I army uniforms, both the dress uniform and dungarees. Although many CCC alumni romanticized their after time in the Corps, it was not a pleasant experience for everyone. Some enrollees thrived, others struggled. I can't imagine what the first enrollees of the program did when they went to a location in the wilderness like Camp Briggs, which had absolutely no infrastructure to support a camp of 200 people. A few camps, particularly in, north, in the Northeast, New York State for instance, experienced wholesale rebellions 
of dissatisfied enrollees. Camp Brinks experienced its own rebellions. However, rule breakers would experience things like KP duty or some other onerous task, have their leaves restricted, or for more serious infractions, dishonorably discharged. Well, it may seem that a dishonorable discharge from the CCC wouldn't have all that much of an effect, but once they received a dishonorable discharge, they were banned forever from having any federal employment. So it did have a little bit of influence. The first CCC camp was in Lurie, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. It opened on April 17th with 200, employed, with 200 enrollees. Camp Brinks was the fifth CCC camp in the nation and the first in Wisconsin. And it opened 17 days after Camp Lurie. Early in May of 1933, CCC Company 640, consisting of 208 enrollees from Milwaukee, left Fort Sheridan by train for Washburn, Wisconsin. A Milwaukee Journal reporter accompanied the men and reported on their first week of experience at Camp Brinks. This photo is from the journal and shows the company marching to the train at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. As Lars, Lars Larson notes in his history of Washburn, northern Wisconsin was dotted with isolated farms on submarginal agricultural land, victims of a misguided campaign to colonize the cutover. The homestead of Ora and Lizzie Brinks was one of them, located on the western edge of the town of Washburn at what was referred to as 17 Mile Post, and I believe it was called that because it was 17 miles from Washburn on the Battle Axe Railroad, which was just south of their homestead. Ora and Lizzie homesteaded this one half section, 320 acres of the Barrens in 1915 and attempted to make a living on the farm they had established. Farming the Barrens was a struggle in the best of times, and during the Depression, it didn't get any better. Ora was once asked by friends of his what his hobbies were. He simply replied, survival. In 1929, the National Forest Reserve Commission approved 43,000 acres of the Barrens for inclusion in the National Forest and established the Makwa Purchase Unit that was occasionally referred to as the Makwa National Forest in the media. Brink sold out to the federal government shortly after, and the Forest Service established a guard station on the property. The site was designated as the location of the first CCC camp in Wisconsin. Not much is known about Ora, but Lizzie was a pretty colorful character. She was born in the mining region of Wales, England in 1874, and the family immigrated to the lead mining region of southeast Wisconsin, southwest Wisconsin in 1883, the year Washburn was founded. After her marriage failed, her first marriage failed, she worked for a time as a sharpshooter and trick rider for the Ringling Brothers Circus. In 1909, she joined Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show. Ora was her second husband, and they married in 1915, the same year they homesteaded in the Barrens. After they sold the farm, Ora and Lizzie moved to 529 West Pine Street, Washburn, and were said to have been well-liked by the townsfolk. Lizzie died at age 68 in 1942, and oddly, she's buried in an unmarked grave in the Woodland Cemetery. Ora remarried and continued to live in Washburn, working Forest Service in several capacities, including as a tower man, and later he hired on with the City of Washburn Street Department, where he worked until his retirement. He died at 75 and is buried in the Woodland Cemetery in a marked, marked grave. On the 4th of May, 1933, 
the company arrived in Washburn and began marching towards Camp Brinks from the Omaha's First Avenue East Depot. All CC workers, all CCC workers were transported by train to the nearest railroad and after detraining marched by foot to their destination. The following pictures are from the Milwaukee Journal as they appeared in the paper on May 5th, May 7th, and May 21st, 1933. The caption of the picture of this picture notes that the company marched six miles and were transported the remaining 10 or 11. I suspect that may have been true for some members of the company, but there were never enough of trucks to haul the entire company in their gear. Trucks would have first hauled gear from the depot to the camp, and after they had finished that mission, they would return along the route to pick up as many uh, uh, enrollees as would fit in the truck and haul them to the camp, and then run back down the highway to pick up another load of enrollees. They would have shuttled back and forth in that capacity. Sometime after the start of the forced march, the journal took a picture of him resting on the side of the road. It's interesting that there are discrepancies in their walking to the camp as well. Gordon Sorensen from Bayfield noted that they walked all the way to the camp, and the journal reporter that was with him said they only walked part of the way to the camp. When Val Hansen signed on with the CCC as a local experienced man, uh, early in 1934, he received an appointment as a junior engineer in the Federal Soil Erosion Protective Service in order to report to Darlington, Wisconsin. The project he was assigned to was abandoned after a few weeks, and the CCC company, which was to have been stationed there, was redirected to a location that would become Del Camp Delta in Bayfield County. Val was ordered to West Salem to meet uh, with other Camp Delta staff members and pick up a fleet of Chevy trucks, a pickup truck, and a Dodge dump truck. Val drove the dump truck across the state. They headed off to Camp Delta but couldn't find Delta on a road map. <laughs> Fortunately, the former station stop of the Duluth South Shore and Atlantic Railway was on a post office map. They drove all day, finally arriving at Delta at 2 a.m. Delta had a combination store post office at the time, and the exhausted CCC boys inquired with a proprietor on the location of Camp Delta. The proprietor said, Camp what? <laughs> and he never heard of it. They finally found lodging on a cabin, and the next morning, August 20th, August 20th, they found a quarter inch of ice and a bucket of water in the oh. corner of the cabin. Oh. <laughs> Camp Delta did not yet exist. It had not been laid out or surveyed at the time of Val's arrival. Today you can find Camp Delta by heading south on the Delta Drummond Road from County Trunk Highway H just east of the Delta Diner. After a distance of almost two miles, you come to two stone pillars on the east side of the road. Camp Delta was on Bass Lake behind those pillars. Val and his colleagues spent a month laying out the camp and surveying the Delta Drummond Road. Construction of Camp Delta began in late September and Val and staff lived in tents on the site along with a company of enrollees from Fort Sheridan. Around Thanksgiving, the company and staff moved to the permanent quarters of the camp and gave thanks for doing so. According to Val, it was getting cold. <laughs> the first enrollees in the program had it much harder than those that followed. In some instances, as I've just noted, scouting parties of officers and a few enrollees went ahead to a camp location to get the camp ready for the first occupants. In most cases, a company of 200 arrived together in a wilderness site, not always sufficiently cleared for tents. Sometimes the hardships provided a pretty bleak outlook for the enrollees. David Rouse, writing his, about his experiences at Camp Devil's Lake in the Wisconsin Magazine of History, noted that loneliness and homesickness hung over the camp like a light fog. Most enrollees had never been away from home before. We were city boys camping for the first time in the wilderness. Three recruits went over the hill during the first David Rouse's first week at Devil's Lake. Camp Brinks had similar problems. 
In June of 1933, one month after the camp was established, 38 men deserted from the camp in protest over a man discharged for refusal to do assigned work, poor food, and inadequate facilities. A month later, 30 men signed a petition sent to our area congressman, Congressman Peavy, complaining about excessive work and inadequate food. Camp Delta, the Camp Val Hansen uh, stayed at, experienced similar episodes. Although attrition did take a toll that first summer, 10% of the enrollees dropped out. The early hardships often turned into stories of CCC lore in later years. It does not appear that a lot of preparation went into the Camp Brink site prior to the arrival of Company 640. Val Hansen notes that the supervising agency, in the case of Camp Brinks, the Forest Service, would have selected the campsite for its proximity to the work that that agency wanted accomplished. I'm sure they picked Camp Brinks because there was a little bit of infrastructure in place to support the group. The camp was not set up when the company arrived. They literally had to assemble the camp that would house them for the next six months. They had to set up their own tents as the Milwaukee Journal photograph on the screen shows. Many camps had eight squad man squad tents, and later pictures of Camp Brink suggest that this type of tent was used. But initially, according to the eyewitness account of a journal reporter, 24 man tents were used to house Company, four, uh, company 640. If you read the official U.S. Forest Service history of Company 640, and you read Gordon Sorensen's articles, they both state that 40-man tents were used. <laughs> the journal reports that the Company 640 spent the first four or five days of its occupancy of Camp Brinks getting their camp squared away. Lars Larson reports that living conditions at the camp were primitive. The men living in tents without floors and eating from mess kits on food prepared in an open kitchen. The well on the property of Camp Brinks ran dry within the first four days, and one of the projects was to dig a new one. <coughs> CCC workers were paid monthly. David Rouse, again from Camp Devil's Lake reports, paydays were no nonsense days and rollies lined up in front of the captain's tent on payday at the end of the month. The captain sat behind a table covered with an army blanket for a tablecloth with a large pile of currency at his left hand and an ominous looking revolver on his right. <laughs> this is a picture of uh, the inside of one of the 24-man tents at Camp Brinks. And even though it has a dirt floor, you can see that everything is in pretty much tip-top shape inside the camp. The beds are made, uh, the uh, duffel bags with the personal belongings of the enrollees are hanging there. Uh, there's no mosquito netting. They're all open-sided tents. Uh, more civilized CCC camps had foot lockers rather than duffel bags for personal possessions. But what I've read from the CCC Legacy Project is that the government did not provide those foot lockers. Those foot lockers were either made by the enrollees themselves in the wood shop of the camp, or they were purchased from enrollees that were being discharged from the camp. This picture again is of Brinks. You might recall the white building on the background on the left-hand side of the slide. That warehouse building stood at the camp until the late 1970s or the early 1980s. These uh, tents that you see in the foreground were behind that warehouse. And that's the cook tent. That's the kitchen tent for the 208 people that were at Camp Brinks. Another picture of the uh, Army Field Kitchen, if you will. The company spent the work, first week or so, 
of their duty, getting the camp squared away, as I said, and they ate outside. In this case, uh, you can see them bundled up in their hats and their coats. I don't know if they have the rain gear on or not, but it doesn't look like a very pleasant eating experience. Though there were rebellions against the quality of food in some CCC camps, uh, everything I've read is that servings of meals were plentiful and that enrollees actually gained weight after arriving to the camps. Again, both of these pictures are from Camp Brinks. Uh, the one on the left is the Milwaukee Journal showing uh, uh, several enrollees on KP duty. Uh, the picture on the right was from Chick Sheridan, and uh, it shows uh, several enrollees washing dishes in the camp. Members of the company were assigned KP, and the duty rotated among enrollees. If cleaning wasn't sufficient in the camp, or the camp wasn't squared away as I showed you on the built-in tents just a short time ago, the camp commander would assign another week of KP to the errant enrollees. Mess kits were washed in two barrels of scalding hot water, one soapy and one for rinsing. Real dishes didn't come until the second season for the camp. Another journal picture. The photo caption is, an army sergeant tells them what to do and when to do it. Well, a journal reporter in the white cap, you can see him on the right side, right, right center of the, uh, the photo, listens intently. They were pretty husky in their dungarees and uh, army issue overcoats, according to the caption. A typical CCC company consisted of about 200 men. In addition to enrollees, the camp was in command of a military officer of the rank of captain or lieutenant and an XO who was most likely a reserve officer with the rank of lieutenant. Service members were also in charge of the mess, a mess sergeant is mentioned occasionally, and the camp exchange. A camp medical officer was either regular army, navy, or a reserve officer. Some camps contracted medical services from a local physician. In addition, each camp had local experienced men, or LEMs, assigned to it. LEMs were civilians exempt from the el eligibility requirements of enrollees. They had a set of technical skills the enrollees lacked. They were project leaders that supervised the work to be done. Generally, they were the locals who lived at home and not at the camp, and it helped lessen the local community ob objections to the CCC camps nearby. I don't know how many LEMs were assigned to pranks, but Camp Drummond, according to Lars Larson, had a camp superintendent, an educational advisor, a foreman and other specialties, specialists, six project leaders and 14 assistant project leaders. Every camp had an educational program. One of the aims of the CCC was to provide educational opportunities for those enrollees that had not graduated from high school and for those that needed to know or desired some technical skill that they could use once they got out of the CCC, such as experience in forestry work or auto mechanics or something like that. The journal reports relating to this picture say, a regular crew of forestry workers, old hands at wood chopping are at lunch talking. They get great amusement out of the re re recruits. One of those Milwaukee men doesn't chop his head off, I'll really be surprised, one of them says. Did you see the way they cut down firewood? Not the trees every which way. They don't even know which way the tree's gonna fall until they see it coming down and they jump out of the way. <laughs> this is an overview of the camp. Again, the white warehouse building that was at the end of the lane that is the entrance into the camp is uh, the big white building on the left. The Army Field Kitchens are behind it. The Brinks Homestead, you can see uh, between some of the pine trees in the center of the picture, and there's a row of nine 24 men building tents on the far right-hand side. The other miscellaneous tents, I really don't know what they are. Surprisingly, 
the infirmary of the camp was in a tent, I would have thought that they would have used the uh, Brinks Homestead or something for the infirmary, but they didn't. Uh, they might have been used, some of these other miscellaneous tents might have been officers' quarters. I'm not entirely sure. Val Hansen notes that camp members and enrollees that undertake routine camp duties, such as cooks, orderlies, drivers, clerks, fire guards, infirmary attendants, uh, and so forth. And then there were the forestry overhead, those staff and enrollees who perform camp duties, administrative duties really, related to the projects that the camp worked on. And then you had the field workers. That was everybody else who really worked out in the field carrying out the projects that were assigned to the camp. Enrollees were recognized for merit and leadership through promotions to positions of leaders and assistant leader. An enrollee got $30 a month, of which $25 went home. An assistant leader got $36 a month. And a leader got $45 a month. So there was an incentive to uh, do well and get a promotion. But Hanson notes that there was also a fourth group of enrollees at the camps, and they were the Goldbergers. <laughs> they were the people who did not care for work or responsibilities, and they exerted themselves more in avoiding work than actually doing the work themselves. Most gold prickers were graduated from the program before their enlistment of six months ended. This view of Camp Rinks is standing on the western side of the camp, looking towards the southeast. And this view is on the opposite side of the camp. And uh, you are now looking towards the west, the origin point, origin point of the, the last photograph that I showed you. The lane into the camp, you can see uh, that goes to the front of the warehouse building. The Briggs Homestead up on the hill as well as the billet tents are up there. And uh, Forest Road 236 runs across the, uh, the screen from uh, left to right. And uh, you can just see a faint portion of there sticking in, uh, out from the vegetation. Interestingly, Lars Larson reports that in May 1933, 145 men from Bayfield County, including 85 expert woodmen, were sent to Fort Sheridan for two weeks of conditioning, after which they were incorporated into Company 640 at Camp Brinks. That suggests that there were 289 men in the company in June. This photo only shows 196, though I don't know the date of the photo. CCC companies were about 200 men. 68 folks left this camp in the first two months. Then 145 more were added, according to Lars Larson. Um, which would have raised the total to uh, 289. That seems like an awful high number for this camp. So either some of the references are in error or the, uh, uh, the attrition rate at this camp was really pretty high. The uh, photograph is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, if you look real closely at this photo, you'll find that uh, Camp Rinks was an integrated camp. That was kind of an anomaly for the CCC. Uh, many states would not permit the program within their boundaries if camps were integrated. The uh, uh, Wisconsin did not take an objection to the integration of camps, and there are three or four uh, African Americans in this photograph. Sure, 
who these are unless they are the Forest Service or camp superintendents that were Forest Service employees. You can tell the cooks, they're all in white. And then the enrollees that are dressed, some of them are in their dungarees and some of them are in their dress uniforms. In 1933, the projects that Company 640 worked on were truck trail construction, tree planting, fire hazard reduction, timber stand improvements, and survey. In another discrepancy in uh, the reports that I've read, the Forest Service reports that one of the projects that uh, the crew worked on was the planting of what was called the Old Maid Plantation uh, in the spring of 1933. The uh, USFS, the Forest Service, has a CCC tour on its Washburn Ranger District website. And uh, there's a map on that website as well as a brochure. And it says that the Old Maid Plantation is three miles from the junction of County Trunk C and Forest Road 236 and is marked by a stone monument. And you can see the stone monument on the right-hand side picture. Unfortunately, that stone monument doesn't recognize the, uh, the old maid plantation, but it recognizes the plantation of a commemorative George Washington bicentennial plantation that was undertaken a year before the CCC was established by the American Legion. On November 19th, 1933, after six and a half months, Company 640 left Camp Brinks and took winter quarters at Camp Morris in Morris, Wisconsin. You can see the buildings in the background are the, uh, the traditional style of building that we associate with CCC camps. They were timber, excuse me, they were wood frame buildings with uh, tar paper covering the outside and held onto the buildings with battens. And uh, many, in fact, I'll, I'll say most of the CC camps in the country were this style of construction. Camp Brinks never achieved that level of uh, permanence, if you will. Camp Brinks was always a tent camp. This picture was taken in February of 1934. I'm kind of surprised by it for a couple of reasons. There's no snow on the roofs of the uh, buildings. Either the insulation was real bad and the structures melted at all, but even on the ground it doesn't appear there's a whole lot of snow on the ground that, uh, uh, that the folks are standing and sitting in uh, for the picture. You can see the officers of the camp on the third row from the bottom towards the right-hand side. And the other interesting thing about the picture is that there aren't any African Americans in this picture anymore. It's a solid white photograph. Whatever integration the camp had uh, isn't shown in this picture. The company returned to Camp Brinks on May 4th, 1934 to greatly improve conditions. Squad tents with wood floors, and they also had a mess hall, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner of this group photograph. I, Every now and then I get mesmerized by a picture, and this picture is one of those. It, uh, the clarity for a 1930 photograph I just find amazing. Uh, again, you can see the two officers in the camp in the front row with the hats on, uh, second and fourth from the left, uh, each holding a dog. <coughs> the, uh, you can see the Briggs homestead in the background behind the, the, uh, the group. And then the front row of this picture on the left-hand side, um, a couple of folks are either holding a hawk or an osprey or something, which uh, is rather interesting. You can see the mess hall in the background, or above the, uh, the group, which was uh, used for the first time in 1934. 
again, another picture of the hog. And look how young that one guy is on the left side of the, uh, of the, of the bird there. Again, some discrepancies in the record. In 1934, uh, what I've read is that an old farm building was fixed up into a kitchen and a mess hall. This building is not an old farm building. It does not appear on other photographs of the camp at an earlier time. It was new construction. 1934 work of Company 640 included tree planting, road building, line surveys, fire protection, and furrowing for tree planting. The USFS history of Camp Brinks notes that there was one day of great excitement in the woods that summer where the men of the 640th Company were working. Forest Service mechanic Peterson was plowing furrows when a giant black bear, easily six feet tall and weighing 500 pounds, charged from his den where he had been disturbed. As the big bear charged, Peterson instinctively swung his tractor around and met the animal head on. The next moment, the wheels of the tractor had pinned the bear underneath, and you won't like this part, and Peterson killed him with the head blows of his monkey wrench. In October of 1934, Company 640 moved to a newly constructed camp on Pigeon Lake, outside of Drummond, and Camp Pigeon Lake became its permanent home thereafter. Again, some discrepancies in the record. When the company moved to Camp, Camp Drummond on Pigeon Lake, not Camp Pigeon Lake, there was another camp at Drummond on the east side, which was called Camp Drummond. The men sat down for, to meals in a comfortable mess hall and ate out of dishes for the first time. Well, they came from Camp Brinks that summer, which had a mess hall. During the ensuing winter, much attention in the company was centered around its basketball team, which won second place in the Wisconsin CCC tournament. Every camp had sports teams, and uh, they had softball diamonds. And in the case of Pigeon Lake, they had a basketball team, and these teams competed with other CCC camps in the area and in the state for championships. During its stay at Camp Brinks, Company 640 completed 500 acres of timber stand improvement. They planted 600, 700 acres of trees. They constructed 20 miles of telephone lines linking fire towers with offices, constructed 44 miles of truck trails, undertook 10 miles of roadside cleanup, and planted 144,000 fish in area lakes. Roadside cleanup is what we refer to as roadside cleanup today. Roadside cleanup was essentially taking to burnable debris out of the side of roads so that roads acted as true fire breaks during a bad season. In 1935, a new company came to Camp Brinks, Company 1606. They continued with the Forest Service work projects. This is retreat at Camp Brinks. Again, you can see the squad tents are in the background instead of the 24-man uh, tents that we've seen in previous pictures. In June of 35, the company was divided into two companies. 1606 stayed at Camp Brinks, but half of 1606 became Company 3653, and they moved to Camp Horseshoe which was south of Camp Brinks on Horseshoe Lake. It's not the last time that we'll hear from Camp, our company's 3653. A typical day at, uh, at a CCC camp started at 6 a.m. with Reveille. 6.30 was flag raising with 15 <coughs> calisthenics following. Then they had breakfast and they policed the grounds and sleeping quarters in time for a 7.15 sick call. At 7.45, work details were assigned and they left for the field. One hour of lunch was provided and they were either provided a cold bag lunch or a hot lunch that was delivered to the work sites. At 4 p.m. they returned to the camp for cleanup, changed into their dress uniforms for flag lowering, 
and at 5.30 p.m. they had supper. After that, they had free time. They could go on educational pursuits, they could go to a recreational hall, uh, have some free time, or they could go swimming at the local swimming hall. At 10 p.m., lights were out. One half of Saturdays were spent on projects around the camp, and a rigid inspections were made. If you didn't meet standards of the camp commander, any leave would be canceled and extra duties would be assigned. Here's a picture of uh, one of those half-day Saturdays at a local swimming hole in a lake, I guess a pothole in the, in the Barrens where members of Company 1606 were having a good time. And the document on the right was a CCC pass that you had to have to leave camp to go home or to go to town. Uh, or anything like that. Company 1606 moved around quite a bit. They were originally stationed in Glidden one month after 640, went to Camp Branks in 1933. And the year following year, 1934, they moved to West Salem where they worked on erosion control projects. And then in 1935, back to north to Washburn and Camp Branks. Uh, and the winter of uh, 35, 36, 1606 left Brinks to winter at Camp Loretta, west of Park Falls. The company doesn't appear in the 1937 annual of the Sparta CCC district, so I really don't know what happened to them. Uh, the CCC had yearbooks, just like a high school, and uh, the Sparta District had uh, a yearbook showing photographs and group slides of CCC uh, camps, and uh, and 1606 doesn't appear in any of them, so I'm not sure what, what happened to them. Company 3653 left Horseshoe Lake for Camp Taylor Lake in November of 35, and then they came to Camp Brinks the following year and continued with road maintenance, timber stand improvement, tree planting, and land surveys. 1936 was an exceptionally dry year. Both Company 640 and 3653 were involved in extensive firefighting. 640 fought the Barnes Fire on July 31st and the Big Brewer Fires on August 7th and 8th. And 3653 fought the August 8th Makwa Fire, started by an NP locomotive near Topside and that burned 21,000 acres. Briggs was a beehive of activity during the fire season and really acted as an incident command center for uh, the fires that were occurring up in the Barrens. On November 4th of 36, Company 3653 moved to winter quarters at Camp Cable and a new modern camp uh, that was the most modern in Wisconsin at the time. They moved back to Briggs in 1937 where their chief operator occupation was tree planting, uh, much of it for restoration of the previous year's disastrous fires. But the rest of the company's work was described as routine. This is a picture of the, uh, the yearbook, if you will, the annual that I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, this is for uh, company 3653 at Washburn Camp Briggs. And uh, you see one of the pictures shows a recreation hall at Camp Briggs, which looks almost like it might have been one of the reconverted uh, farm buildings. It also shows the infirmary, which was the tent structure that I alluded to earlier. They did have a baseball team. And they did have a band. On November 1st, 1937, 3653 left Briggs for the last time. History doesn't say where the company is winter, or at least I haven't uncovered it as of yet. In 1937, Company 640, the original company of Briggs, was set to uh, assist with flood relief from the Great Ohio River flood in January of 1937. This is a 1938 aerial photograph of Camp Briggs. Brinks was utilized as a side camp after 1937, meaning that a full company was never stationed there after, uh, from 1937 to 1941. What, what a company would do, let's say a company in Camp Delta, 
if the Forest Service had a project that they wanted done at Camp Riggs, they would take enough manpower from that other company, a company at Delta or at Drummond, and they would send them up to Briggs. It wouldn't be a full company, and they would stay in Briggs as long as the project required, and then they'd go back to their home company. In 1937, from the 1938 photograph, this is what I can discern of what was at Camp Briggs. You see Forest Row at 236 on the angle from the bottom to the top of the picture. You can see the lane going into the camp at the junction of uh, uh, Forest Road 437 and the warehouse at the end of the lane. There are foundations back there where those buildings uh, existed. You can see the location of the mess hall. Uh, the billeting area is what I think might have been a bathhouse or a latrine on the property. And uh, a road that goes off to the northwest, which I'm assuming might have been a camp dump that they located away from the, uh, the main camp, but I don't know that. That's my speculation more than anything else. Well, what's left of Camp Briggs? It's pretty well grown up over the years. You can see the foundations of the warehouse and several other buildings at the camp at the end of the lane. There's, of course, the Camp Briggs sign that's there. Uh, the general location of the Briggs homestead on a hill to the south of the lane, as well as the billeting area, which is pretty much grown up into brush and trees. Uh, this is a picture of where the warehouse stood. And uh, now it's used by, I guess, folks that wander out there. I think the Forest Service calls it an undesignated site or something, campsite or something like that. And uh, uh, there's a picnic table there. Some people have used the old uh, floor for a fire ramp. Uh, there is a, some type of foundation of a loading platform for trucks back in the woods. Uh, there's another foundation off to the north of the warehouse, which I'm not sure what the building was. The Camp Brink sign is at the entrance of the lane. And these are just views of, uh, of what the surrounding area looks like. Uh, this is a view of Highway 437, uh, looking towards the entrance in the background of the picture of the, uh, the camp. Uh, this is looking south of 236, north of the entrance lane, and how the trees have grown up over the years. Looking north along 236, again with the vegetation that's grown up over the years. This is the warehouse building that stood until the 70s or 80s when uh, the Forest Service used this as a guard station up in the Barrens. Uh, this building was loaded with equipment and uh, tools that were used in fire fighting. They were uh, pre stationed in the Barrens so that uh, the response time to any fire would be uh, increased. Uh, Eric Adams tells me they had an auction in this building in the early 1980s where they got rid of all that equipment. And he acquired <coughs> this Maddock, which I think looks more like a Pulaski than a Maddock, but it's actually stamped on the handle CCC. And uh, if anybody wants to look at it later, you're more than welcome to take a gander at it. John Klingness from the Bayfield Heritage Association gave a presentation to the Bayfield Heritage Association two years ago uh, on the CCC and the cutover. And he suggests that the two-story portion of the CR Treasures building on Washburn's west side along Bayfield Street <coughs> originated at Camp Brinks. He claims that this structure was moved to Valhalla and was used at Valhalla for a number of years before it found its way into Washburn. He also notes that the building south of Washburn on Highway 13, that's part of a full affordable auto repair, also came from Camp Brinks. 
I don't know what his source is for that information, but um, uh, that's what he has suggested. I was told, I think, at the last session of the Washburn Heritage Association that this building was sold from Camp Brinks for $650 and was immediately flipped by the person that bought it and who sold it again for $1,100. <laughs> Probably one of the original property flippers in the county. <laughs> Val Hansen was present during the building of Camp Delta, but then he was transferred to Camp Pigeon Lake. He lived in Drummond and worked on landscaping projects. He worked in the Drummond office of the CCC until it folded in 1942. And I guess I did skip over a part. In 1937, Roosevelt proposed that the CCC be a program that is permanently funded. But Congress didn't approve the expense. Again, they were worried about the costs and the signs of war in Europe, as well as the Pacific, were starting to uh, burn on the horizon. And the, the director of the CCC died in 1939, and he was the strongest advocate of the CCC. Uh, the CCC lost a lot of its influence in Congress after his death. And so in the fall of 1941, the draft for manpower by the armed services began in preparation for the conflict that became World War II. CCC enrollees started leaving the program for the Army. Camps began to close for lack of manpower. And camps started closing as early as 1938 because the economy had been improving immensely over the decade. In June of 1942, the program was closed down due to lack of funding by Congress, and that was the end of the CCC. Val Hansen, after he left, uh, the service of the CCC joined DuPont Corporation at the Barksdale Works, and I believe he retired from DuPont in that position. I thank you to a lot of folks for their assistance in this program, particularly Susan McGrath of the Washington Historical Society, David Bradley, and the Rhinelander Pioneer Park Museum, which had copies of the Milwaukee Journal, which I had uh, shared with you. Thank you very much for your attention. If there's any questions that I can try to answer, I'd be happy to do that. site was a home, a farm, farmstead. It, uh, Brinks were farming that property before the, land, the, government the government purchased the land. Brinks wanted to sell out and the government bought it as part of the Makwa purchase unit of, uh, of the National Forest. So what about the fires? The bigger fires? The big fires were 36 and 37. I can't tell you about the history of fires after that. I would imagine that there were, but the histories I've read don't go that far into the future. <laughs> I, yes, ma'am. Um, you said that the young men got to go on leave. What did they do? They would, did they come down to Washburn and raise heck, or? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> there were regular trips in the communities like Washburn, the communities that were nearby the camps. Again, I, I spoke with somebody on our last get-together that suggested uh, uh, there are many local girls that found their spouses from CCC and Rollies at Camp Brinks. The uh, uh, Saturday nights, they would be brought into town and uh, dances were held in various locations. The, uh, I'm sure there was a fair amount of drinking that went on because uh, Prohibition ended the January after Camp Brinks was founded. Uh, uh, at times, there were dances actually held at CCC camps, where uh, the uh, Corps would send a truck to a community like Washburn and take a, a truckload of, uh, of 
women back to the camp and they'd have a dance out there. Uh, worship services were also held at camps and sometimes uh, the Corps provided transportation to local communities to attend worship services in town. Lots of times, I shouldn't say lots of times, but a few times people even went home on leave. But I don't know how you'd go home on leave for a day and a half. That just doesn't strike me as being practical. But uh, that's about all I know. Yes, ma'am. Are there any authentic CCC camps in Wisconsin that are left that you can go and visit, like for historical sites? Well, at one time I thought Pigeon Lake would be one of those, but I understand Pigeon Lake was torn down during the 30s, and it was rebuilt as a underprivileged children's camp. And of course that turned into a university field station after that. There is a camp in Minnesota, I think Camp Robodeau, in uh, Chippewa National Forest, which is probably the most intact example of a CCC camp in the Midwest. If you can find it online on the web. And yes, ma'am. You talked about the yearbooks that were produced. So is there a record of the persons who participated in the CCC camp? A roster, if you will? Yes, I have not found it. Uh, I've been on the CCC Legacy website, which it does suggest how you can access those records, but I have not followed through in attempting to do that. But I'm sure there's a record someplace. Yes, Sharon? Sure. There was a uh, mention, and I read this in Lars Larson, in 1937, there was the street reconstruction of Bayfield Street. And they talk about 25 positions that were part of the Works Progress Administration that were for uh, I infrastructure improvement projects in Washburn. Is that a separate initiative, do you think? It is a separate agency. It was a separate program of, of Roosevelt's New Deal. Okay. But there was some overlap in the CCC assisting the WPA in its projects and vice versa. For example, the uh, concession building at Copper Falls was built during the Depression. The CCC started that building. They didn't finish it. I don't know why the Works Progress Administration finished that building. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I promise I'll keep it to 45 minutes until we're over.